Swim Things and Blue Springs, your one-stop shop for all things swim. Pools, spas, patio furniture, swimwear, and accessories. Visit them in Blue Springs or at www.swimthings.com. It's, it's interesting because obviously, you know, we are in society where women don't get the same um, opportunities as men, but I always think back to swimming and being a co-ed sport. And I do have to say that I think that we're in a sport that does shine on both women and men. And I never really had those um, incidents or experiences growing up where I felt um, I didn't get opportunities because I was a woman. I feel like I've always been pretty persistent and um, if there's something I want, I'll go after it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Journey. I'm so excited to talk to today's guest. She is an Olympic gold medalist, a former world champion, and world record holder. Let's welcome Caitlin Sandino to the show. How are you today, Caitlin? I'm great. You know, I have to confess, I'm a little bit of the post-Christmas blues. I just put away everything Christmas in my house. I'm like, well, I put away tears right now. This is my favorite time of the year, and it's always so bittersweet to put it away. Already looking forward to next year's Christmas. (laughs) Yeah. I know my mom, she usually doesn't, she usually likes to take down Christmas decorations like right after Christmas, but I think this year we all need a little extra, extra. Yeah. (laughs) So I actually got to meet you in 2013 at a swim meet where you and Alex Lang came to the pool to speak about (gasps) you. Yes. And it was for my longtime friend, Sam Smith, who sadly passed away in 2017 from cancer. And you just kind of shared your story about where you began swimming and kind of where you are now. And I actually, after you got to wear your gold medal, and I just remember thinking, this is amazing. I'm wearing (laughs) a real gold medal from a real Olympian. This is amazing and crazy. Um, And I just hope you know that meeting you um, kind of then helped me persevere and continue on the path that I'm on um, to become a nurse. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. That's so, uh, it kind of gives me the goosebumps to have that full circle story. And I know Sam and just being out there and oh my goodness gracious, but thank you. It's uh, very touching. So for those of the, for those of you don't, who don't know, what is Negu? Okay, so Inigo was started by Jessie Joy Reese um, when she was first diagnosed with two inoperable brain tumors. And Inigo stands for never, ever give up. And that was Jessie's motto to kids fighting cancer. Uh, she started what is called Joy Jars. Joy was her middle name. And they're just containers that are just meant to um, send a boost of love and to brighten a day and to encourage a, a child to never, ever give up. And um, through, gosh, uh, probably the last eight years, I've been a part of this amazing foundation and the whole mission is to spread hope, joy, and love to children fighting cancer and to encourage them to never, ever give up. So how did you get involved? Why did you want to be a part of this movement? Uh, so Jessie was a swimmer and the swimming community is very small and they're very supportive. Uh, she's actually from, um, I was born in Mission Viejo, California, and she was from Mission Viejo. Uh, so when she was first diagnosed, they held a fundraiser for her to help raise money for all the medical bills. And I was asked to come out and to bring other fellow Olympians or national team members and uh, was there in a heartbeat. And that's when I first met Jessie's family. And that's where I first met Jess. And um, I just knew instantly I wanted to do more and I didn't really know what it would be at that time. Um, it actually wasn't until after she passed when her family re-reached out and asked if I'd be interested in delivering joy, jar, joy jars to the hospital visits. And that's what started this um, incredible relationship that I have with the Jess Reese Foundation and the Reese family. That's awesome. So I understand that your family has dealt with cancer recently, but everyone is cancer free now, I hope. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So my sister actually, she's actually supposed to have her last surgery today um, and just too much going on uh, to explain, but she couldn't do it today. So we have one more surgery for my sister to get through, but she, yes, she is cancer free. My mom is cancer free. Uh, Basically my mom was diagnosed in 2015. And basically when she wrapped it all, then my sister was diagnosed. So we've been dealing with this for within our family for the last five years on and off. Um, Sadly, yeah, we know it all too well, but it was almost like, (laughs) 
it was almost a blessing that my mom had already gone through because literally my sister went through the exact same hospital and we already knew a lot of the doctors. We knew a lot of the protocol. Like they're like, what are you guys doing here? You know, they like kind of felt bad for us. They're like rushing my sister through everything. Um, but we had um, amazing support, amazing doctors, amazing blessings. And, um, you know, now all of my sisters and I are just staying on top of our health and doing our daily or uh, doing our own proactive um, part of being you know, on top of our own health, since it was my mom and my sister that both had breast cancer. So when you say on top of that, I think it's so easy to kind of just put, um, just health appointments aside, like even like your dentist, you're like, Oh, I'll, I'll go next month or I'll go when COVID goes away. You know, it's like, you got to stay on top of that stuff. So we're just trying to be proactive and, um, just counting our blessings right now. Yeah. I would imagine it definitely stays a part of your conscious with your own health because it, it is a big part of your family. And like you said, you, you, don't want to put it off and you can't put it off. No, you really can. And it's like one of those things where I feel like it's so easy to put off. You know, there's a million other things that you'd rather do than to go sit in a doctor's office for like an hour or two. Um, but, you know, just my sister was relatively young when she was diagnosed. My mom was a really rare case. Um, so it's just, you just never think it's going to happen to you or you never think it's going to happen to your family member. And sadly it's everywhere right now. It truly is. So the you Jesse know. Reese foundation is just one of like, I think, a thousand ways you've been giving back to this sport since you retired in 2008. I mean, I, a long list. You wrote a book. Uh, you helped start a company to make swimming fins. You do broadcast work. And you're the general manager of a professional swimming team, which, you know, five years ago wasn't even a job at anybody, anywhere. <laughs> uh, did your plans for life after you finished swimming include any of this? Um, I would say the book was always on my radar. I always wanted to get that bucket list item accomplished. I, you know, for the longest time, didn't know how, um, but luckily things came together and I'm happy to say that, you know, I did it. Um, but no, I mean, gosh, when I was going through college and even a little bit during my swimming career, like broadcasting had always kind of been in the back of my mind. When I first went to USC, I thought I would major in communications at this amazing school out there, um, Annenberg. And um, <laughs> because of swimming, I couldn't take all the required classes needed for the communications major. So I ended up majoring in something else, but had gained so much experience um, in being comfortable in that role, right? Like from being, doing interviews from a young age to motivational speaking, just to being in front of a camera um, and just feel like I have a strong um, sense of vocabulary and just communication skills. And then it's just about staying proactive. I mean, you know, Jeff, like the more you do it, the more like people see you and you kind of just start getting your reps and you kind of like fall into a place where you have like a little niche. Um, but I just really enjoy it. And I think that's what is the important part. Cause I think that's what shines through. I think it's obvious when somebody likes what they're doing. Um, and that's what I, that's what kind of my whole goal in life is to uh, really enjoy what I'm doing. So uh, obviously not every day is easy and every day's had challenge and all these projects have had challenge challenges. Nothing came very easily. Um, even like the fins, you know, being a startup, com uh, being in a startup company, starting to uh, develop a fin that we, you know, hope that everybody enjoys. That's challenging too. You know, we don't have a lot of resources. There's not a lot of us working. There's not a lot of money. Um, and everybody's a critic and, you know, just trying to please everybody's hard. And then being in this role as general, general manager of DC Trident within the ISL, I mean, that's one of the most challenging roles I've ever had um, besides being a professional athlete. Uh, just the day-to-day -day is still new to me and um, have to wear many, many hats. Again, being a startup, I don't have a lot of help. I don't have a lot of staff. I don't have a lot of uh, uh, salary that I can pay people to help me. So I am trying to uh, learn to juggle and um, figure out what I'm good at. And I'm a big believer of like, I have no problem saying what I'm not good at and that I need help. And, you know, I think for a little bit, it took me a little bit to be okay saying what I needed help with or what I, what I don't shine in. But once you can accept that and own up to it, that's when you can just become stronger because then you can get the right people around you that, that make you look like you know what you're doing, you know? And so it's all about teamwork. It's, it's definitely, it takes a village um, and especially in a lot of the different avenues I've been in recently. Oh yeah. 
Well, you make it look easy. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. It's always easy when I'm working next to you, Jeff. That's when I get to shine my best. I just let you take away. Yeah. I just have a couple comments here and there. <laughs> um, I want to make a, a mention of your book just real quick. It's called oh, Golden Glow. Everybody should read it. It's really fascinating reading. And I learned a lot about you that I didn't already know. And I felt like when I picked up the book, I thought I'd already known everything about you. So uh, it's really very insightful into the mind of you being a professional athlete. And, and, um, and I, I just recommend it to everybody. Um, but there are a lot of accomplishments you've had in your swimming career. And I want to mention, I mean, we, it could take a whole hour to go through them all. But I think maybe the one that always stands out for me is you just making the Olympic team in 2004 after dealing <laughs> with all those injuries that you had in the years dealing up with that. Um, can you detail some of those injuries that, from what I understand, almost caused you to give up on the sport? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the probably the most common and typical was a shoulder injury uh, by syntendinitis. It's kind of like if you swim, you've pretty, probably dealt with that. Uh, but the one that was uh, and the one that I felt like this was going to be the end of me is I had stress fracture in my intercostal muscle. Um, and that was challenging because it was almost a two-part thing or it was a two-part thing because obviously it's this um, physical injury, but it also affected because I have asthma. So my asthma was never really under control at this time of my life. So I was constantly coughing. And every time you cough, you know, you pull across your intercostals, like pull apart. And so there was a fracture in there. Maybe the fracture was from coughing so much. Like we don't, we don't know what caused it. Um, so the back injury was one of those things where I had to get my asthma under control to allow my back to heal. And so I had to go down that route with every like asthma specialist and then having to see the right specialist for my back. And then literally what it came down to is like, I kind of just had to stop everything. You know, I stopped swimming. I was only doing physical therapy. Um, I was getting my asthma under control with the right medications. I saw like the right pulmonologist and everything for that. And then it was a process of kind of like two steps forward, one step back. Like I would go to the pool and swim like a 200 and that would be like a huge accomplishment, like a 200, like that's nothing. Right. Um, and so just having the patience of the healing process is, was really challenging. Like I'm like not a patient person. Like it's definitely one of my flaws. Um, and obviously when you're in the midst of training to, you know, accomplish things at that level, like you don't have time to have these setbacks. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was a long journey. It was about it a year of really trying to get over it. But if I'm being like really honest and thinking back on my career, like I felt that injury, like the whole rest of my career. Like sometimes if I would get back into training after taking a break too quickly, my back would bother me. Um, if I had um, like any type of asthmatic, like flare ups, my back would bother me. So it was one of those things um, that persistent pretty much until I really stopped from the sport in 2008, but, um, it was kind of just a series of things. One, one thing after another, you know, that a shoulder injury, a back injury, then I was in a car accident and just getting sick a lot. I had a really bad, um, fever when I was swimming at NC2As and it was like one thing after another. Um, but I feel like that whole process, like shaped my career to be all the more bittersweet. And, um, it's made me a tougher person and it made me realize that, um, you know, it takes a lot to, to, to bring me down and, um, it's all about mind over matter and, uh, believing yourself and, and having that passion for the sport to continue going. Yeah. And, and you being a distance swimmer anyway, you're already <laughs> mentally tough. So I, th I think personally that Thank probably you. helped you in a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. You know, I, I think so. You know, I was, um, just kind of always been a, I was a tough kid, like took a lot to kind of phase me. Um, I never really got nervous. I, I loved all, I thrived in all competitive, um, environments. I, I loved all sports. I was kind of a huge tomboy. Um, my sisters are so much older than me when I, you know, like we have a big age difference. So growing up, they didn't really hang out with me because I was so much younger. So I kind of grew up with all the boys in the neighborhood or all the boys on the swim team. Um, and then throughout my career, I kind of always found myself training with the boys. Um, so I definitely feel like I, I've had like a, a tough exterior for quite some time and, and, and mentally, obviously, but I, I have like a really like soft, like gushy heart. So <laughs> I have a little bit of uh, both. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to that 2004 Olympics, which uh, obviously was a, a big deal for you to make. But um, I think a lot of people remember that 800 freestyle relay, obviously you and, and the other three ladies breaking that longstanding East German world record. But I always will remember that 400 IM with you <laughs> in that battle with Yana Klochkova at where I thought if you had another five, I know. Um, but I, 
what I what I really found exciting was that in your book, you talk about that silver medal that you got in that four item is actually being a gold medal for you. Yeah. Um, why does that silver medal mean so much to you? Absolutely. You know, for me, it's um, it's kind of everything that I went through to get it. So it wasn't just like the race in itself. It wasn't just like those four minutes and 34 seconds. It was basically the four years between 2000 and 2004. Um, you know, we briefly touched on it, but you know, all those different injuries and illnesses that I had gone through those four years. And, you know, there was definitely self-doubt that crept in those four years and, um, you know, putting on weight and just not loving the sport as much and being burnt out. And, you know, it gets really frustrating when things don't go your way. So you're just like, oh, I'm over this. Like, let's move on. So it's like when I was in this moment of this race, you know, I had this huge goal to break four minutes and 40 seconds. And that's all I was really worried about. Um, but even like before then, like I was just hoping to make the Olympic trials. Cause that's how like things had really not been going my way for so long. And then to go to trials and then to qualify in all these events and then to make it to Athens and then make it to finals in the 4am. It's like, okay, here's my time to shine. And so, you know, being in this like iconic battle with Yana and then to come at the end and yes, I touched silver, but when I saw my time and I saw how much I had personally improved from those four years, to me, it was my personal goal, you know, like, yes, I, you know, I was, I got second by 12 hundredths of a second. Um, but me personally, like, I don't think I could have gone any better. Like that was gold A plus in my book. Um, but I did look at back and I did have a bad turn from the best, the back to breast. So maybe that's it right there. Um, but I think, you know, for me, um, I use it when I'm doing my speaking engagement, because I think it's relatable, right? Cause we don't always get first. We don't always win. We're not always a top pick, like, but if we personally are doing our best and that's a personal win, that's a personal accomplishment. So it's like, that's my personal gold. Um, and I think we need to change that mindset in society. You know, it's like, if you watch the Olympics right now and Jeff, like when we watch these like international meets and whatnot, there's not a lot of emotion from swimmers, even when they win. And then like when they get second or third, they're just kind of like, huh. Second or third, like that's still incredible. Like silver or bronze or fourth or fifth or just making finals. You know, it's like, it's sad to see when people aren't proud of themselves or don't want to celebrate. It's like, you've trained so hard. Like this is the fun part, right? This is where you get to shine. This is where you get to let loose and, and celebrate your own personal victories. Um, so, so for me, I was just so wrapped up in the moment and it was, I mean, yeah, it's silver when I look at it, but like mentally it's, it's, it's gold in my book. So when I look back at my swimming career, like that's like my, my gold medal moment, even though it's silver. Right. It's literally the journey. It's the yes, journey. It's, it really is. It's, it's like, just like Jeff and I say all the time when we close out our show, it's not about the destination. It's the journey that gets you there. And you said it perfectly. Oh, thank you. It's so important that we like really take the time to like reflect on that. Right. Cause it's, it's so easy to get wrapped up in that one moment like the one behind the blocks for that one race but it's like it's so much more went into like that and unless you like write a book or have a documentary about you people don't really know about everything that went into your journey um but it's the struggles that make it all the more bittersweet because it's it paid off right like it'd be so easy to give up but then you wouldn't have these amazing um, accomplishments in the end so after the Olympics, um, you were done with collegiate swimming. What or who convinced you to stick around for the 2008 Olympic trials? Um, you know, that's a great question because I always thought I would be done after college. Because at that time, too, there wasn't really a lot of places for professional women to go train. I mean, there was a couple programs, but there was like a men's team at Michigan, which I was like, please let me come swim with you. They're like, okay, we're not going to train you different. So that's where I went. Um, and you know, I think honestly, like if I'm being really transparent, it's probably because I signed a four-year contract, you know, it was like, I had this opportunity with Nike that was going to pay me for four and a half years. Once I signed with them to swim until 2008. And it's like, well, what an opportunity, like, which a didn't really exist back then B uh, Nike wasn't really signing a lot of people. And I literally could make a living. Like I didn't have to have another job. I literally could be a swimmer. Um, so it was that opportunity that Nike presented with me. And um, so the fact that I had, overcome those injuries and had that amazing for me in 04, I was re-motivated. I was refreshed. I was re-energized to give it another go. And, um, I've never, 
had the opportunity to just be a professional athlete. Like I'd always been a student and I'd always been in classes and I, you know, it was almost like you had two jobs or like three when you're thinking like social life, academics, swimming, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm like, let's get, let's give it a go. And, and that's, that was kind of, um, the contract that sealed the deal. It's like, okay, let's do this. And then I had to find a place to train. And then that was kind of, for me, um, a big, what should I say? Just like a, a moment as a woman to pack up and leave and move across the country and buy my first home and live by myself and really blossom outside of, you know, being very, I've always been in pretty comfortable environments. You know, I had a great relationship with my parents and everything in high school was great. And then I didn't go very far away for college. I was very comfortable in Southern California. And then I pack up and I go to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm like completely out of the element. I have no family there. I hardly know anybody. It's really freaking cold. Um, you know, it was all these elements, you know, learning to drive in snow, like all these elements that I, that wasn't in my comfort zone, um, really kind of matured me, I guess you could say. I mean, obviously I had a lot of amazing swimming experiences in Michigan. But when I look back, I'm more grateful for how I grew as a woman when I lived in Michigan. So tell me about this set of 50 flies you did with John Urbanchuk and Bob Bowman um, that you did when you were training at the University of Michigan. Oh, it's funny. How do you know about this, Molly? (laughs) I told her about it. Jeff, I was like, I wonder if Jeff, okay, well, it's funny. So whenever we went into Irby, I swear he always brings this up. Um, we, we would always kind of repeat sets, you know, 3100s and, uh, and 9400IMs and, you know, and then we always had this 3050s, but then it was a gamble, like what stroke are they going to make us do today? Um, and it was always individual, you know, depending on who you were. And, um, I got picked for the butterfly 3050s long course. I don't remember the interval. Um, I probably like blacked out, but I just, it was, it was so painful and you had to get up and go from a dive on every single one. And I, <laughs> Irby said by the end of it, I was crying, but I don't, I wouldn't make it visible. I was probably crying like in my goggles and then, um, you know, struggled to finish. And then weeks later we had gone to the Marinostra meet and I had busted out the best time in the toner butterfly. And Irby's like, see, it's from those 30, 50s butterfly. And I'm like, oh, I don't want you to be right, but maybe you're right. I don't know. <laughs> Oh man, the stuff we used to do. <laughs> I know you look back on it, it's like, how did I survive? I know. And it's funny too, because in high school, I didn't really ask a lot of questions and I didn't really pay attention to our sets or how much yardage we would do. And um, to this day, I still have a great relationship with my club coaches and we'll get together at these meets and he'll start talking about uh, sets I used to do. And uh, we, they used to like reminisce on that. I'm like, what? You had me do what? And I was like, no, I didn't do that. They're like, yeah, we just, you just went and you went and you trained hard. And I was like, oh, I don't remember that. And at Michigan, I mean, Bob used to write down all of our workouts before we got there. And it was just like, the walk of dread, like, what's it going to be today, you know, to see it on the, on the whiteboard or to see it on a piece of paper. And then Irby, he's just, he's a uh, pretty infamous for the workouts he writes and it's writing all over the paper. And you're just like, well, I don't even know how to follow this, but um, again, it just, it's just kind of um, solidifies, you know, we're tougher than we think we are. Yeah. Well, you're obviously a very talented swimmer. Did it come easy for you when you were younger? Um, you know, <laughs> When I was like young, young, it was like good. Um, and then grade school, junior high, I did well, but I was really small. Like I was really short and I was really skinny. So all the girls that had already gone through puberty or that were going through that, the ones that were taller, bigger, stronger, they were beating me, you know, but at the same time, I really held my own. Um, yeah, I look back and see pictures of when I was in the high school. And I like, I literally look like I'm in junior high. And I'm almost like, no, you're in high school. Um, and I was just really strong and determined and feisty and <laughs> really like to race. Um, and then my uh, junior year of high school is when I started to like get some height and get some muscle and get some weight on me. I think I broke like 105 pounds in junior high or sorry, in my junior year of high school. Um, and so that's why I felt like I could really um, kind of step up the best. And so um, I don't want to say it was easy then, but I feel like I had a lot of success that happened at like rather quickly. It's like kind of like I was doing good. I was doing good. And all of a sudden I was like, boom. And then I made the Olympic team. Like that was like my second ever international swim meet. But I also think it's all timing too, right? Because of the increments of every four years, it was just um, really bittersweet timing for me that it was just um, when I was kind of on a roll. But then, yeah, I mean, definitely had challenges between 
uh, 2000, 2004, and the same thing between 2004 and 2008. So it was kind of like this between those uh, last eight years. But I would say during like my club years, I trained really hard, which so I don't think it came easy per se, but I had um, some success that kind of took off rather quickly. <laughs> and how involved were your parents through all of this, this oh progression through the sport? Uh, my parents are just like my biggest cheerleaders. Uh, they don't really, they didn't really know a ton about swimming, which was really nice. I think it's like kind of like ignorance is bliss and all they were were just really focused on getting me to practice and making sure I was healthy and eating. And, you know, my mom was like super mom, like making sure I had like a lunch after school on our way to swim team and making sure homework was done. And, you know, my dad worked a lot of hours and um, that allowed my mom to be a stay at home mom. And um, they put in, you know, all the taxi driving and all that goes into it, but they weren't like down my throat about practices or what I need to do better. Like they couldn't be like, Oh, your elbows dropping. Like my mom and dad would not know that, you know? And, um, they'd always be like, Oh, he, my mom and dad like always really enjoyed watching me swim. They thought I had beautiful strokes and they always really liked to go to my swim meets and they liked watching me race. Um, but they wouldn't be able to tell me like if I was, you know, dropping my elbow, <laughs> but so the number one, number one, um, support system or cheerleaders, number one cheerleaders was definitely my parents. Well, that also, that's awesome. That definitely helped you. Um, I, I would imagine that little girl from Southern California probably would not have imagined that she would be the general manager of one of the teams of the International Swimming League. I still think that, I mean, I know you have a lot more things coming your way, but I, looking back, I mean, I think that's a big, big, big moment in your life. How did this responsibility come your way? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, really, um, Lenny Kraselberg approached me about this um, opportunity because Lenny and Jason had already started getting into ISL when they were trying to start that first meet in 2019. Um, and then there was some conflict with FINA. So then it got pushed. Um, and then they were like, well, let's get some more teams involved. And um, they wanted uh, two more GMs in the US and um, ISL prides himself on equality. And they wanted to look at women that they felt like could be up to the task at hand as well. And um, Lenny recommended myself. And then that's when um, he called to see if I'd first be interested. And then I wasn't really very aware of what this was to begin with. So I wanted more information before I made any type of, you know, next move. And then, you know, after everything he told me about it and how much it could advance our sport and give our athletes, you know, some really amazing opportunities, I was definitely really interested. And then um, the ball started rolling with meeting with other uh, representatives from ISL. Then I was flown out to Antalya, Turkey for a rather long conference and um, things went from there. And um, it, it's, it's pretty surreal definitely it's like a huge responsibility um but like we talked about earlier I'm just so passionate about our sport and making it better for the next generation that the hard work um you know it it definitely shows perseverance in our sport to like you know start something from the beginning but when you see how much our athletes are enjoying this and how much they're thriving off of it and even just this past year that they were able to be at um, a camp where they're able to train and come together and race um, I mean what an amazing accomplishment I will say I'm really proud that the league and myself we pulled this off um, just because there was times where I'm like there's no way this is going to happen I mean it's already really hard to plan everything and then you put COVID in the mix of it, it's just stress level off the charts. Um, but like I said, it's really rewarding when you know what we're doing for our athletes and for the, the, the sport of swimming. So you're the only female general manager in the International Swimming League. How does that impact the work that you do? Um, you know, well, so first of all, there, so Tina Andrews is a GM for New York Breakers. And then, um, there's Darina who is with iron. So there's definitely some women present. So that's really cool where we can support each other and rally around each other. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting because obviously, you know, we are in society where women don't get the same um, opportunities as men, but I always think back to swimming and being a co-ed sport. And I do have to say that I think that we're in a sport that does shine on both women and men. And I never really had those um, incidents or experiences growing up where I felt um, 
I didn't get opportunities because I was a woman. I feel like I've always been pretty persistent and um, if there's something I want, I'll go after it. Uh, so luckily I feel like, you know, in this role, it's more about representation, right? And people seeing that women can do this job and that, um, oh, it was so cool. We were at the meet this past camp and one of the girls that, one of the women swimming on iron said, when I grow up, I want to be one of you ladies. And she's pointing to the three female GMs and she's like, so badass, you know? So it's really cool for other women to see that we're capable of doing this. Um, and really in this role, it's, it's great to have um, amazing communication skills, which I think women are really strong at because you are connecting with 32 athletes and you have six to eight staff members and you're really trying to form like a family and um, a culture that you're proud of. And um, I think that's something that I do really well. And then it's learning the business side. It's a lot of hustling on the other um, side of from, oh gosh, I handle everything from social media to apparel, to caps, to flights, to COVID tests, uh, to, you know, it, it, it's people's 1099. It's crazy. Like everything that we do, because we are such a small, um, you know, staff at this time um, going forward. I hope that changes. Uh, but more than anything, you know, it's a lot of pride and um, it's a big responsibility that I take very seriously and just really want to be fair and um, have good um, representation on DC Trident of all colors, you know, every, every nationality. And um, it's, it's a lot of pride. It definitely is. Do you still get the same buyer you got when swimming competitively <laughs> now as a general manager of the DC Tridents? Yeah. You know, it's, um, I'm a very competitive person and I've had to learn how to check my competitiveness because there's only so much I can really do and control. Um, obviously it's, it's fun to win. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> something that I miss, you know, DC Trident, we, um, you know, we didn't swim as, as well as I thought we would do this past year, but at the same time, I didn't know what to expect. Um, it was such a surreal year where everybody's training environment was so, um, different and out of the normal. And some people could only swim like three times a week. And some people didn't have access to a gym and some people couldn't do long course. And some people like, this is the first time they've had teammates in like months, you know? So more than anything, I just needed to take a step back and, you know, this is out of my control. The team that we have is the team that we have, and they're going to swim their hardest. Whenever their hardest is right now, we got to take it, you know, moving forward. Like I need to re recruit um, where our holes are and get stronger moving forward. But yeah, I, I definitely get um, nervous or anxious before we get behind the blocks and I get really excited for races I know that we're really strong in and I get a little nervous the ones that I know we're a little bit weaker in um the, 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 there's definitely a fire um there but at the same time when I'm, I'm just cheering that's all I can really do <laughs> what keeps Caitlin Sandino motivated every day Oh gosh. Well, I can't say that that's an everyday thing. Um, <laughs> um, you know, right now I've just been trying to give myself grace because I think it is a hard time. Um, there's some days I'm like really motivated and I want to be really productive and I want to work out and I want to eat healthy and I want to sit at my computer and get a lot done. And there's some days I just like want to curl up on the couch and, you know, turn on Netflix. And I think that we need to be okay with that right now. Um, usually if I sit on the couch, I feel like, um, just like, worthless or like, I shouldn't be doing that. I feel like I need to be doing something constantly, but, um, right now just learning to give myself grace and be in more of a, a day to day mentality. Um, because unfortunately we can't really plan for a lot right now. Um, you know, with ISL, it's different. We had to plan like it was going to happen, but at the same time, in the back of my head, I'm like, this could be shot down like a week before we leave, a day before we leave. Um, so I'm just trying to stay in the moment, um, and to, have things to look forward to. I think that's really important right now. It's hard when you can't go out with your friends or you can't go to dinner or you're not supposed to go on vacation and you're not supposed to get on a plane. Like that's hard. Like I thrive in that. Like I love going out to dinner. I love getting together with my friends. I love going on vacation. Um, so it's like, it's little things like, like today I was looking forward to sitting down with you both. And, you know, it's like at the end of the week, we're celebrating my father-in-law. It's like, I get to see some family. Like it's, it's little things like that. And it's just not, it's, it's being grateful. That's another thing of this past year. I, I feel like I do a good job of um, having a good sense of gratitude, but right now, little things to be grateful for, I think is so important. Um, just, you know, the roof over our head and that we have a bed to sleep in at night and that I haven't gotten COVID and, you know, my sister's healthy. Like there's so many things that we need to count our blessings for. Um, I think that's almost more important to me than, um, 
staying motivated because I feel like that will come in waves, you know, and, um, you know, like Jeff knows, I mean, we were booked for some really cool things last year that were all canceled. And it's like, it's kind of hard not to get bummed about that. And it's like, you know, I'm not booked for anything like moving forward besides, you know, it was ISL. It's like, that's kind of a bummer. Like I'm used to being at this meet and that meet and, you know, getting ready to go on, on deck live with Jeff. And that was exciting. It was stuff to look forward to. And now it's kind of like this huge, like question mark, you know, I, I swear I get asked like every other day, like, are the Olympics happening? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not planning the Olympics, you know, and it's, it's like, I'm just trying to make it to the weekend, you know? <laughs> so I'm sorry, that was super long-winded, but you know, right now I'm just in, in, in a process of giving myself grace, um, staying full of gratitude and trying to live, um, day by day because I am such a planner. Like I literally have a planner and I write things down and I, um, I like to have a plan. I'm not super spontaneous. And right now you have to really learn to go with the flow. Yeah, well, I think you, you just have to think about it from this way. When you're a professional swimmer, you took days off. I mean, there were days where you just, you you didn't want to do anything. And even when you had to get up at five in the morning to swim, you weren't motivated, but you did it and it, and it paid off. So I think we when we're away from the athletic side of our lives, we tend to think that we have to keep going. It's kind of like a, yes. somebody actually equate this to me, like, you know, in our, in our lives now, in our thirties and forties, we have to, we're like a shark. We have to keep moving or else we die. Everybody just passes us by and all these opportunities are gone. And I've, I've always said, you know, sometimes, well, if the opportunity doesn't, if we miss that opportunity, another one is coming very soon. And we just have to just be okay with that day of sitting on the couch and watching Netflix because yeah. we all need it. Yeah. And we all need it. And we need like, trust the journey, right? It's like, we're going to look back on this and then, yeah, look at the journey. Like what we already talked about, like my journey between 2000 and 2004, like wasn't awesome, you know, but the end it was great, you know? And, um, that's kind of, you know, I had a really great reminder watching church yesterday. And it's like, there is a plan, like we will fall, but like, we will be okay. And that was, it was so simple, but it's like, yeah, things aren't going to go as planned, but we will be okay. And it's just, I think we just need to remember, remind ourselves that, and we need to remember others around us too, that everybody's struggling in these times and that we need to check on each other. I think that's something that um, I'm trying to be uh, more present and aware of too, just like with family members and um, loved ones and, and friends, like, how you doing? You know, like this sucks. <laughs> Are you okay? You know? Absolutely. Um, so in, in all these aspects of your life now that are, are involved with keeping up with, with swimming, what is your impression of the current state of swimming? Um, and looking at it through the lens of someone who has been one of the fastest swimmers in history. Honestly, like my heart hurts for them because of this huge question mark and the uncertainty. And, you know, I've gotten like, well, would you have kept swimming? And I'm like, well, what generation, Caitlin, are you talking to? Like, if this is 2000, Caitlin, yeah, of course I would have kept swimming. You know, I was like 17 years old. Um, if this was 2008, Caitlin, no, I was so ready to be done. My knee hurt, my shoulder hurt, my brain hurt. Like I just, it was done. And I, I don't think I could have hung in there for another year. Um, so to me, my heart aches for the swimmers. Um, a lot of them don't have teammates. A lot of them are in and out of the pools. They think they have a pool and it's closed the next day. And our, our college athletes, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, honestly, I, I really couldn't. Um, but everybody's training situations are so different. Like there's some people and they haven't missed a beat and you're like, good for you. And then there's some poor people that are like, yeah, I had a girl on my team that her sister got like an endless pool and she was swimming by herself in an endless pool. It's like, oh God, like training for a high elite athlete in an endless pool, I couldn't even imagine. Um, so my heart hurts for them. I think uncertainty is hard, especially when the, the Olympics is always like a four-year plan, right? Your plan was just out the window. But again, we're talking about the journey and the better so of everything. So it's like, I, I hope that they feel supported is like kind of like was one of my biggest things as GM when I was recruiting and getting our team together. I wanted them to feel like they weren't alone and that they had somebody that was rooting them on and like they weren't on this island of just like being by themselves, you know, like even though we feel so far distance from people, we need to like feel like we have a network, which was so cool. And we all got to come together for ISL because here, here we were like 600 athletes that were kind of like thrown the same curveball, right? They're all in the same ship basically, but then they got to come together. And even though they're racing against each other, you know, on the teams, they had each other to, they, 
with athletes that are going through the same thing they are. So I think it's, you know, it's easier to be with people that realize like what you're going through and you can bond over that and you guys can come together over that and train to forget for that and be more grateful for the opportunity together. So um, I, I don't know what I think. I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know if the Olympics are going to happen. I keep hearing yes, no, yes, no, for sure. Oh, not at all. But then it's like, well, what about Olympic trials? You know, it's like all these huge question marks and I don't know. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard because you just don't know. Like you said, it's just full of question marks. But I think obviously the, the having that ISL mini season was a, a very big, bright moment for all the ones who were able to be a part of that. I could, and you could see it in their eyes. Yeah. You know, they were all just glad to just have that opportunity to race and to be around other people. And and I think now I think everybody is a little bit uncertain about what's going to happen, but we all just have to get through it. We just have to keep going. And as, as if the end of this is going to be, yes, there is an Olympics and Olympic trials, how it's going to be, we don't know, but uh, I, I really do. Like you said, my, I really do wake up every morning, just hoping that there is going to be some positive sign with this. And every time I don't really see that, um, my heart hurts for for all the athletes too because I've I've been through that too and I've I've actually thought about it myself, Caitlin. I thought when they announced the Olympics were canceled last year, I said, "Well, if I were in my mid twenties, yeah. I would probably not have." I would have said, "Well, oh well, that chance is gone." But yeah, if you were eighteen, nineteen years old, you're like, "Well, I'm going to swim in college anyway. Three years from now, why not?" But um, it's it, there are a lot of hard questions that people have to answer, and um, it, it's it's going to be tough. But you know, Kayla and Molly, I have to say this: when I've always said this, when the Olympics do happen, if it if it really is going to happen this summer, it's going to be a big old party, and everybody's going to be happy to to see everybody. And I think everybody's just going to let loose because it's going to be some really fast swimming. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be the celebration that brings everybody together through all this. Most definitely. Well, I know there's, you know, you said that you're, you know, this year is a lot of question marks for you. You don't have a lot um, that you know is planned, but is there anything coming down the pike for Caitlin Sanino that, that, um, you know, you, you think could be happening for you that, um, you know, that, that keeps you, keeps that motivation kind of up there? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because you got me on what, January 4th and this is all right time to put some pieces in place here. Um, you know, season three is definitely in the mix for ISL. You know, it was nice. We took, got to catch our breath after uh, that trip. It was a long trip, a long time to be away. Um, it was kind of on call 24 seven. Um, so I definitely needed time to catch my breath and reflect and um, really just re-energize. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's like, all right, I got some amazing time with family. I've got to be really present, um, healthy and I um, want to get back into a workout plan, even though we're in this quarantine holidays hit. And she's like, ah, I don't need to work out, you know? So um, there's that side of things, but yeah, right now it, it's um, kind of seeing where 2021 takes me. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because um, you just, you just never know when a phone call can come through or an email can come through. And I always have eyes open and um, just ears open. Cause there's so many things I'm, I'm passionate about. And there's so many things that I like and um, I, I just like to kind of hear all opportunities and, um, kind of see where this creative world takes me. And, you know, I have my priorities being my husband and my family and, and my health and, um, and, and then we go from there, but it will be, be interesting to see, um, again, what happens with the Olympics, because obviously ISL has to plan a schedule around if the Olympics happen or not either. So we're also in a little bit of a standstill because, um, you know, the camp mentality uh, or the, the camp setting was something that was um, that would be used again for season three. Um, but when we don't know, uh, we have ideas and we're going to have to plan as if something is happening. Um, but we're not quite there yet, although there's been some great movement and some great meetings at the end of last camp. Um, but we do have to wait a little bit as well. <laughs> Well, Caitlin, it was so nice chatting with you today. I still can't believe that we're getting a chance to speak after eight I know. Years. crazy. I, and I know I can speak for Jeff um, when I say we really appreciate all you've done for the communities around you and just being able to be here and present and talk about your journey with us today. 
Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a trip to reconnect for all these years. And Jeff, I've missed you tremendously. It's just not the same, not being on the road with you. Hopefully sooner than later. Hopefully sooner than later. And like we always say, it's not just about the destination. It's about the journey. We'll see you next time.